future, talk radio will actually educate, inspire, and make you think. The future is now. Topics and music that affect your life. From Universal Broadcasting Network. Tune in at ubnradio.com. She's passionate about telling stories of amazing women who are rocking the world and empowering women to live, love, and thrive. Here's your host, Katherine Gray. Hello, welcome to Live, Love, Thrive Women's Empowerment Hour, brought to you by 360karma.com. Today, we have on the incredible Gloria Strzok. She is an amazing woman. She's an actress. She's a sculptor. She's an author. And she's 93 years old. She is still rocking it, and she is going to be on our Forever Young panel at the Live, Love, Thrive conference on November 4th. We are super excited about that. And then later in the show, we're going to be talking with Wendy Hyman, who's an entertainment attorney and sponsor of of our She Tank event, November 3rd, which is all about women helping women entrepreneurs and helping get them funded. And we're going to be talking about that. So stay tuned for later in the show. But right now, please give a warm welcome to Gloria Strzok. It's Strzok, actually. Strzok, right. how are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing uh, fine. Good. Um, wow, your life has been absolutely fascinating. You know, yeah. I have to agree with you. Yeah. Yeah, because I came from a theatrical family. I was born in New York, came from a theatrical family, and my whole family is in the theater. I know. And uh, actually, they're from the costuming end. My my dad founded the Brooks Costume Company. I know, which was one of the most famous. Uh, it was. They did them of all time. Uh, well, his first client was Ziegfeld. Oh my so gosh! So he did the Ziegfeld Follies. But all they Brooks did the costumes. Uh, for uh, I would say the majority of the big you know Broadway musicals right and they also did the circus and Sonia Honey Ice show etc. now what a lot of people don't know is this started with your grandfather having a uniform business yeah, my right grandfather had a uniform business yeah and um, he wanted my dad to work with him at the uniform mm -hmm. because it started after World War two right and so he wanted my father to go down to the docks and hand out cards if you know men were going to be uh, continuing service and um, he hated it. Yeah. He really Your dad hated dad loved it. Broadway. Yeah, he loved Broadway, loved yeah. the theater. Well, anyway, what they did is uh, Brooks was called to do uniforms, little bellhop uniforms yeah. for a musical. And they did about 20 uniforms. And, but it put them onto a list of costumers. Oh, wow. And then when Daniel Froman, who was a very big producer, Broadway producer in those days, he unfortunately went down in the Lusitania and they were auctioning off. He had a small amount of costumes himself, about mm -hmm. 300 costumes, and they were auctioning it off and Brooks, now Brooks co Costume, received a card. And he said to his father, I'm going to bid, I'd like to bid on these costumes. And he said, because there were so many balls in New York, they were, they were the Beaux Arts balls and things like that. Yeah. And he, he, my father saw a business. He just yeah. saw it. He had know. a vision. He absolutely yeah. had a vision. And and how did it become Brooks? Because that's not well, your name. Well, the name is Strzok, but my S T R O O C K. Right. But my grandfather thought that that was difficult to pronounce. Which I just. Uh, uh, oh, that's okay. <laughs> which I just uh, have verified. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and uh, so they arbitrarily changed it to Brooks. Yeah. So that remained. But then, interestingly Brooks. enough, your sister kept the name Brooks, right? Well, she didn't take keep the name Brooks. She took, took the, the name Brooks. Brooks. Yeah. Because I had started working. You, wait, let's start with. So okay. your your sister was a famous actress as well. And, and she. Geraldine. She, Geraldine. Yeah. She was 15 months younger than I was. We yeah. called her Jerry. And um, she decided that she didn't want to use the name Geraldine Strzok because I was Gloria Strzok. Right. So she just changed it to, uh, to, Brooks. to Brooks. And she was under contract to Warner's when she was 15 years old. Uh, oh 19 my years old, sorry. Oh, when she was 19. Young. Yeah. And. Um, <clears throat> So was, you both wanted to be actresses born out of the fact that your family was so involved with Broadway? Well, it, I think so. And my yeah. mother did modern clothes for the stage. Yeah. And that was, that's an interesting story, if you, if you want, want me to tell you. Uh, my parents were inveterate opening nighters on Broadway. And uh, one day, or one evening actually, mother said, who does the modern clothes? She said to my dad. And he said, well, they really don't have designers for yeah. that. 
He said sometimes the actress wears her own clothes, sometimes the producers wear. He said, Bianca, that would be a wonderful career for you. Oh my gosh. He said, you've got great taste. I think you'd love it. So to make a long story short, my mother d had to uh, uh, join a union. She yeah. joined the United Scenic Artists of America. And um, she started doing uh, shows. And she, they opened up a, 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 a um, department for her at Jay Thorpe, which was on 57, and then at Henri Mendel, also on 57. Oh my gosh. And, but then what happened is it became difficult to do a show because it beca because um, they were too uh, upscale. Right. And so she, she, you couldn't, let's say, get a maid's uniform or uh, big bulky shoes for a character in, 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 in a piece. So as a result, she went off on her own. And I remember this so well. She asked my father one day, she said, Jimmy, could you, could Brooks make a wine velvet smoking jacket for me for Basil Rathbone? And my father looked at her and he said, Bianca, what would you do if I wasn't in the costume business? <laughs> she said, but darling, you are. <laughs> <laughs> so what were your parents like? Well, let me see. How do I describe them? Um, they were different. They really were different. Uh, then, like my mother didn't make brownies, yeah. and um, she wasn't your typical. No, she wasn't typical, and um, she was witty. Yeah, she was sometimes a little bit sardonic. You know. Yeah. I remember, I was going to be under contract, as it turned out, to Paramount, and I was 21, almost 21. And I just didn't want it. I didn't want to be in Hollywood. I wanted to go back to New York. I wanted to be in the theater. But we were visiting my sister in California at the time. And my mother came into the room and found me sobbing. And she said, darling, what's the matter? And I said, mommy, I don't, I don't want to be a movie star. She said, well, that's all right, darling. You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of the, the way she handled it. She didn't hold me in her arms. And, and of, encourage you. Uh, or no, or <laughs> discourage me. But your dad, but, you said, was very protective. Uh, my dad was very protective. Yeah. And he was just... In a good way. Oh, the most wonderful. Yeah. He was just there, you know. I didn't understand or I haven't understood when people say they have your back. I didn't know what that meant, but right. I do know now. Right. And that he had, he had our... He absolutely had our back. My sister as well. Yeah, yeah. There was so both no of questions. you became actresses. So we became actresses. I know you said you started uh, doing uh, theater. Well, I right? started, um, yeah, I started doing theater. I did a lot of work in television. Yeah. Television was very early at that right, time. Right, right. And uh, you were one of the first. I, I mean, was, yeah. I was. And then you were telling me and that then, you actually were on stage with Marlon Brando. Yes. Yeah, before I, he was like super yeah, well, famous. Well, in fact, I'm doing, I'm writing my memoir. Yeah. And I, I have that. one chapter. It's, uh, that I've written, it says, before Marlon became Brando. Ah, <laughs> so, <laughs> that's cute. <laughs> and your book is a cast of characters. My so book is called A Cast of Characters. Type. So is this book about all the different people you've met in your life and this well, it amazing is. It journey? is, but the thing is, I wasn't trying to write a book at all about celebrities. Yeah. That really wasn't in my mind. Right. But it turns out that throughout my life, I interacted with people that were celebrities. Well, let's face it. Okay, so not only your actress, which uh, I know you were on one of my favorite shows, was uh, Macmillan and Wife. Yes, you I played, played Rock's husband. Uh, Rock I played Hudson's Rock's uh, secretary. Uh, secretaries. Yeah. You know, that's what a funny What was that story. like? What was it like working uh, with Rock Hudson? Oh, uh, that was fun. My husband directed. That was my husband's show. Oh, my gosh. And um, I was married, and I had kids at that point, and I hadn't been working. I mean, deliberately, because yeah. I wanted to be a mom. But then it was a point, and I wanted to get back. And yeah. my seven-year-old son said, I think you should go back and, you know, mommy. So at any rate, Leonard gave me a very funny, uh, my husband's name is Leonard, <laughs> uh, gave me a very funny piece of direction. Because there wasn't a lot of dialogue, and it was the first time I was on the show. And he said to me, Gloria, you, want, you have to sneeze, but 
and Rock, don't let her sneeze. So they went on with the dialogue, and I went, <laughs> and Rock <laughs> put him, you know, he just knew how to make something yeah. from, from, not, from whole cloth, yeah, really. Yeah. Uh, and he was a really lovely, a lovely man, Rock was. Just, well, yeah, I just mean, a darling man. you know, these are such icons that you had. I know. You got to meet. You got to meet a lot of icons. I did. Yeah. Yeah. And I your did. husband, uh, famous, famous uh, writer. comedy writer, right. Leonard Stern. Right. Um, he worked for Jack Parr and. Uh, no, he worked Jack, for Jackie oh, Gleason. Jackie Gleason. You know, I remember when. Uh, and Leonard, several uh, others, right? Yeah. Jackie Gleason's. Uh, um, It'll come to me. It'll yeah, come to me because okay. he did so and much for himself. And I know he himself. created gr uh, one of my other favorite shows, Get Smart. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Get Smart was his, his and show. And then growing up, uh, we did the Mad Libs, and your husband was behind that, too. Well, that's an interesting, very interesting story. It was before I met him. Yeah. And he was working on the Gleason show. Um, I think it was Gleason. And his friend, Rob, Roger Price, and Roger was an, uh, also as a humorist. Roger uh, walked in the room and he said, you need any help? Because Leonard must have been doing something like that. And Leonard said, yeah, give me an adjective. And he said, um, bulbous and funny, something like that. And then they started to laugh and Leonard said, look what we wrote. So we looked at the paper and it was that Gleason's boss came in with a bulbous nose. Yeah. There were two, it was another adjective, I've forgotten it. And they realized they had something. They didn't know what they had, but they felt they had something. So Leonard put the script aside, and they wrote s these stories that afternoon. They went to a party. They told some of the stories. People are laughing because they came up, came up with crazy adjectives. Or and for people that don't know what Mad Libs are, it leaves a blank where you fill in an adjective or a noun, exactly. and then you read the story. And, you've and you don't know what the story's about. You're just throwing out an adjective or a noun, and, and it's hilarious. It is hilarious. Yeah. And they they went to the uh, that night they went to a party, as I said. Now, the people at the party said, you've got to do something with this. Yeah. It's wonderful. And I think they were smart. Leonard didn't feel, and Roger went along with it too, that they should do anything about it until they had a name for it. And they sat on this for a couple of years. Yeah. They were at Sardi's when, uh, you know, the restaurant Sardi's in, on, off Broadway. They were in Sardi's for dinner one night, uh, a couple of years later, and they were seated next to an actor and his agent, and the, uh, agent said, oh, the actor said, I think I'm just going to add a little bit. And the agent said, that's a mad thing to do. And Leonard went, mad, mad libs. libs. Oh my gosh, that's funny how it came now, up. Now it is, it became so, so well known. I remember not too many years ago when Leonard had a letter from the New York Times and they asked him to write a mad lib for the uh, for the 50th anniversary of Mad Libs. Oh my gosh. And can people still get those? Or yes, you can. Oh my gosh. I will be happy to get you. Ah, <laughs> I love them. Um, and uh, and that was also promoted on one of the talk shows he was working on, right? Which really got it Well, yeah, promoted. that was Steve Allen. It was probably the Steve. Steve Allen show. That's what I was trying yes, to think of. Yes, it was. Of. It was a Steve Allen show, in fact. And Leonard had said to Steve, let's invite, uh, let's introduce the next guest with a Mad Lib. Yeah. And Steve loved the idea once he heard about it. Yeah. So, you know, they asked the audience to give us a jet. And it was, I, I think he was, they in introduced Bob Hope as thanks for the communists. <laughs> <laughs> so there were all kinds of things like that, yeah. you know. And it's, it's caught on. Uh, the, my husband had, uh, his car said Mad Libs. His, his license, rather, I'm sorry, said Mad Libs. And in time, uh, our daughter Kate inherited the car and was driving a car called. Oh no, I'm wrong. Kate was taking a trip through uh, through the United States, a yeah, part of it, right. and passed a car in another state, and it said something something mad mad Libby, something oh, like that. Oh. And she stopped them and she said, "Excuse me, I wonder, would you take a picture of me with this?" Oh. Because she said, my dad, in, you know, invented, created, the, created this show, yeah. and um, I, I'd love to have it. And how do you happen to have the name, Madam? Their daughter's name was Libby. 
Oh. So it was Mad Mad <laughs> Libby. Mad how Libby. cute. How cute. Yeah. So uh, how did you meet Leonard? Oh, <laughs> I met Leonard. You know the, the um, Phil Silvers, the humorous Phil Silvers? Right. Well, Phil was a friend of my sister's, and he was dating her. And your sister was in movies Geraldine as Brooks. well. Yeah. yeah. Wh which movies? She, the first movie she did was called Cry Wolf with Barbara Stanwyck and Errol Flynn. Oh, my gosh. And then the next movie she did was called Possessed, and it was with Joan Crawford. Oh, wow. And she was introduced in Possessed, you know, with a separate card. Yeah. And... Um, so d being that she was working with these people, did you meet them? Did you meet Joan Crawford? And well, I, the, I didn't Barbara meet Stanley? Joan Crawford, no. But I, if I have an interesting, if you're interested yes. to hear. Okay. Yeah. Um, Crawford was wonderful to my sister. She loved her, and she would watch her always when she would had takes, where Stanwyck just totally ignored her. Yeah. You know, she was a, a young actress. And yeah. Stanwyck was a well-known actress. So she just did kind of ignored um, Jerry. We yeah. called her Jerry. You had the behind the scenes on who was who was nice and who, who was, was not nice. so and yeah. But Crawford was interested in Jerry. Yeah. And she said to her, Jerry, you see up there, that's called the key light. Always be in the key light. Oh. Always. It's gonna il illuminate you in any scene you're doing. Yeah. So and she'd watch her and then she'd just a little yeah. bit more that way. Yeah. Helped her out. She, yeah. And then Crawford retired from film. She married a man who was CEO of Pepsi-Cola. Oh. Um, and the first Christmas that Jerry was in her, her house, she married the author Bud Schulberg. Yeah, as I, I think I said that. And they were in their house for the first time. And Crawford sent a board that, that this, I can't stretch my huge, hands. Huge, that, huge. Huge. Yeah. With bread and cheese and uh, wine on it, you know. How sweet. And she kept watching Jerry. Uh, if Jerry would do a show and it was on television, she'd get a letter from Crawford. Oh my gosh. And then my sister regretfully became very ill. And she was, it was, it was 1977 at that point, she was almost 50. And she became really, really, really ill. And passed away. Uh, you know, yeah. And, um, so sorry. She, um, but she got a call, and the call was that asking Jerry if she would do uh, um, the eulogy for Joan Crawford. Wow. And she said she would. She went to. She was living in on the island, but she went to New York, stayed with a friend of mine, and Jerry. Her friend said Jerry was coughing so badly. And then she went in and she steamed, you know. And then when she left, she turned around to my friend and she said, the next one's going to be mine. Oh, my. And it was. Wow. It but was. she did get through it? She did she it? She got through it. And I was having lunch at Scandi. Remember Scandi on Sunset Boulevard? Mm -hmm. And a woman came over to me. It was right after this time. A woman came over to me and she said, are you Geraldine Brooks' sister? I said, yes. She said, I thought so. She said, I just want to tell you something. I was at Joan Crawford's funeral, and your sister did the eulogy. And I can't explain to you. I can't yeah. understand it. But she was talking about standing in the light. Oh. And when I read that she had passed away less than a week later, I can't explain it, but I wasn't surprised. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, what a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, you're so you met Leonard Stern. So I met Leonard. And, and I didn't want to meet him. Life, I, I didn't want to meet him. Uh, I heard because that. Because I thought, well, I don't, a comedy writer, <laughs> Jackie Gleese. Yeah. I mean, I'm just going to sit down at the table and he's going to pull, pull the chair out from under me. That's what you thought. That's you what thought he I was going to be a prankster. Right. Yeah. And he, he wasn't at all. Yeah. Anything but. And he was a, just a really a very brilliant and, and empathic man. He sounds like and it. And he was a darling man. We were married 56 years. Oh, my gosh. You know, he's, how beautiful. He's, he's gone about six years now, I think it is. The 11, uh, What did you love most about him? He liked, he thought women were smart. 
smarter maybe than men. And no I wonder think, he was married to you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I like that. <laughs> I really liked everything about him. Yeah. He was so, he was just so smart. Yeah. And he I had a darling I think you have to be smart sentence. to be funny, don't you? Don't you? Don't, I think so. And, and he, I never heard Leonard make a joke using a dirty word. Never once. Just clean, good the, humor. Clean, but uh, truthful. Yeah. yeah. You know, it was, it was absolutely, tr absolutely truthful. I mean, you see the honeymooners, which Leonard created from a sketch. Jack Jackie was doing that as a sketch. Oh. And l it was Leonard's idea to turn it into a half hour, you know, so it became the honeymooners, the situation comedy. And it was all based on their foibles, really, but right. it was truthful. Yeah. Nothing's funnier than real life. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah it was such a cutting edge show. Wasn't it? Oh my gosh. And when I look back at it, I think, oh my gosh, this would never fly today. It was very, you know, uh, machismo, yeah, right? Right. The humor, yeah, of the Gleason show. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think it would but fly today. You do? I do. Yeah. I mean, funny is funny. Yeah, funny is funny. <laughs> so, uh, what's next for you? I know you just did a one woman show. Well, here's what's next. And your um, book. Yeah. Yep. I'm writing my no memoir. No grass is growing. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm writing my memoir. And um, it, I'd never written, but Leonard always used to say to me, you know, Gloria, you're a good editor. Because he'd yeah. ask sometimes, he'd ask, you know, run something by me. Right. And um, when he, 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 had, he had gone, he, was, he had passed away at this point, and I belonged to a wonderful theater company called Theater 40. In, uh, it's in Beverly Hills. And uh, someone from Theater 40 said, Gloria, I want you to come with me Saturday to a writing class, Donald Freed's writing class. You're going to like them. They're going to like you. And I, I won't take no for an answer. And I didn't want to hurt her feeling, you know. Yeah. But I thought, what am I going to a writing class for? I'm not writing. Anyway. Little did you know. Little did I know. <laughs> I'm up to 362 pages. I little love it. I. Good for you. You go, girl. <laughs> well, I want to mention as we're wrapping up that uh, you are going to be at the Live, Love, Thrive conference on thank our you. Forever Young panel. I'm so honored. Oh, thank you. Um, which, for those of you that don't know, on Saturday, November 4th, the Live, Love, Thrive Conference has the Forever Young panel, which is women in their 80s and 90s who are still rocking it, like <laughs> Gloria. So we're so excited to Thank you. have you there. I'm looking forward to that. And we're looking forward to your book, Cast of Characters. Cast, my book is called Cast of Characters. I'm okay. also a sculptor. I know. I know. So. Also a sculptor. I mean... N yeah, no grass growing here. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you for being on Thank today. You. Thank Thanks you, sweetheart. So much. And we will be right back with Wendy Hyman. Thank you for tuning in to the Live, Love, Thrive show, where we bring you powerful and positive programming about women and those who support women's empowerment. It seems by sharing their stories and showing us their talent and potential, they remind us of our own. We ask you to join us weekly by taking a minute to subscribe to our 360 Karma YouTube channel so you get to see every episode of these uplifting and inspiring stories. We all need more of this, yes? And did you know we have the Live, Love, Thrive book on our 360 Karma website and on Amazon? If you enjoy reading books of incredible women who are doing amazing work in the world, you will want to pick up a copy. Also, when you join 360karma.com, you will enjoy our growing video content of expert advice and support and learn about our workshops and our second annual Women's Conference in West Hollywood, November 3rd and 4th of this year. If you would like to align with a like-minded, purpose-driven community, you will feel at home at 360karma.com. We encourage and support you to live the life you love. RTB Financial Group empowers women to raise the bar and take control of their financial future. For more information, visit rtbfinancialgroup.com or call Amanda Barr at 424-284-4216. The Live, Love, Thrive program is brought to you in part by Honda of downtown Los Angeles, supporting the equality and empowerment of women. And we are back with Wendy Hyman. Let's give her a hand. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm not sure how I follow Gloria. I know. She's a tough act to follow, right? <laughs> she is right? a very tough act to follow. What a wonderful 
woman and yeah. incredible legacy and stories. We're so lucky uh, with this 360 Karma events coming up that we're both involved in, that all the amazing women involved, huh? I know we just had a lunch yeah, yesterday and with thank the... thank you for giving so many women a voice. It's oh, incredible. Thank you. I mean, you know, we're all here to do something and, and we have to figure out what that is. And yeah. You know, if it's helping get women seen and heard, then I'm I'm all for it. That's awesome. <laughs> and I know, you know, in your practice, you know, you have a very specialized niche in entertainment uh, law uh, that we're going to talk about. But I also know you're such a big proponent of empowering women, and of course, that's why we've connected and right. why you are behind She Tank. Which, um, for those that don't know, She Tank is a, a, a panel of investor women successful women that want to help mentor and fund other women entrepreneurs and we have six exciting amazing entrepreneurial women that are pitching these incredible um, business ideas like things I would never would have thought of you know and uh, I, 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 I'm so excited that you are sponsoring that yeah, you it's and be uh, very exciting. Michonne of uh, Hyman Nolan Nolan Hyman. Nolan Hyman. <laughs> Nolan Hyman. That's okay. She beat yeah. me up over that one. <laughs> and uh, we're grateful to have you support that. Well, thank you. We're grateful that you're letting us participate. Oh, thanks. Uh, so meanwhile, what is it that you do? Uh, I know people would love to understand more about uh, the special niche of law that you guys do, which I wasn't even aware of. But uh, in entertainment law, traditionally, uh, firms are, you know, in television and film in a traditional way. Right. But you all are in this new cutting edge, uh, location based, uh, would I say interactive? Uh, so, uh, well, my, my specialty is uh, location based and immersive. Immersive, immersive was the word I was trying to which, think of. Which um, I like to say up until about five years ago, people considered me a carny. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, you know, those of us in the carny business, we yeah. knew where the industry was going, yeah. and so it's finally yeah. uh, caught up to us in terms of visibility. It's finally any, right place, right time. Right place, right time. I often yeah. wondered what I, whether I'd live long enough, but <laughs> thankfully I did. No, um, traditional uh, entertainment is kind of going by the wayside, like not as many people going to movies, not correct. as many people going to malls, but the new malls and the new movie theaters are this new immersive entertainment. And I think a lot of people don't even know what we're talking about by saying that. Would that encompass like virtual reality? Or? Yeah, yeah, so let me kind of explain for those of your listeners yeah. and viewers that don't Us really understand people. what that is, um, location-based and immersive entertainment is really the sector of entertainment where you as the audience or you as the guest are a part of it. So rather than um, sitting passively and consuming entertainment as you would television and film, um, you're a part of it. So museums, theme parks, touring productions, virtual reality, virtual reality arcades, 4D theaters, all the yeah. technology that's involved, all the content that's involved. And the reason that my partner, Michonne, and I started our firm is she, she comes from a corporate entertainment and licensing background. I come from a, a transactional immersive entertainment background. And what we saw happening is that traditional ways of entertainment producers, content producers, mm -hmm. creators, innovators, mm -hmm. the traditional way that they were deriving revenue mm -hmm. was changing because of the advent of digital media. People were fast forward, forwarding through commercials, right. um, digital music. You know, it was hard to monetize mm -hmm. your music content because right. kids were getting it, downloading, downloading it off the internet. Right. For free. For free. And we really anticipated that there was going to be a squeeze on the entertainment industry to really try to figure out where people were going to monetize mm -hmm. their creations. Right. Um, and we also believed that traditional entertainment, I don't mean to disparage the traditional entertainment right. attorneys out there, yeah. but that the typical way of thinking about a creative product was very siloed. So you had television, you had film, music, toys, you know, merchandise, apparel. And we saw that a lot of these things were converging. Right. Um, you know, we start, we, we're starting to have wearable fashion, yes. right? Or not wearable fashion, wearable to technology. Technology, yeah. 
So where does that fit in? Um, when does uh, a movie that's completely immersive and your seats are moving, when is that no longer a movie and when is it really a different form of entertainment? And as a result, the way you look at uh, structuring deals, the way you look at helping people grow their businesses, um, achieve their startup aspirations, you have to take a much more strategic, holistic, aggressive sta you know, standpoint of really slicing and dicing surgically. So the way I like to analogize it is uh, the apple slices are getting thinner and thinner and thinner. And mm -hmm. so you have to think about the more slices you get out of an apple, the more you can monetize it, the more you can do something with it. Right. But you have to be working with people that really understand how nuanced um, the opportunities are. And you have this vision. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You're a visionary. I, I, you know, I have seen, I saw it for years that the traditional entertainment models were drying up. Yeah. I also saw that uh, real estate, um, because of online shopping, yeah. uh, that retailers were going to be suffering, mm -hmm. but you still have real estate. Right. So how do you activate the real estate right. to keep your lease prices up? And, and then, what, what type of clients do you have? Like what are they? I represent anyone in, I call it the ecosystem. So I represent people who are developing theme parks or mm -hmm. attractions mm -hmm. for various locations. Mm -hmm. I represent the service providers, technology providers, writers, designers, anyone that create provide, the content. Create the content. Uh -huh. uh, I represent both licensees and licensors. So I represent studios who are interested in doing deals with the developers. Uh, to license their entertainment content. Like I, 3D entertainment or? What, yeah, what, so yeah. Uh, I represent studios when they want to do deals with theme park developers, and then I represent theme park developers when they want to do deals with the studios because branded content is very powerful. People um, like to go and consume the character of the brands they love. And so to have a really successful location-based project, oftentimes, People want to license, license a property to right. make it more viable. Right. Um, and so I, I get. So like what in would those. be like a type of uh, product or you know that you would license? Like, give us an example. Right now, I'm working on a very large scale project. Um, I can't reveal too much about the identity or the location, um, but it is a very large, uh, world class um, theme park destination somewhere in the world. And it's a multiple. Mars? Is it Mars? Uh, in the world. You said in the world. In the world, not the universe. Um, oh, right. Uh, and um, we are in the process of, it's a multiple intellectual property park. So it's not mm -hmm. just one property. It's not Disney. Right. Um, and so we're in the process of acquiring various properties, um, movie properties, comic book properties, things like that, so that uh, it's a branded experience. The kids mm -hmm. will be able to go. Families will be able to go um, and experience, much like a Disney experience, but it'll be various properties. They say the malls are moving in that direction. Uh, well, VR arcades, yeah. that's something I'm really actively involved in right, right now. Um, with the advent of VR technology, virtual reality technology, to really experience virtual reality effectively, it's difficult to do that in the home. Right. Um, you can. My kids do it. Yeah. And, uh, with the goggles? With the goggles. Yeah. Um, but they say a lot of people don't want to do the goggles or. Yeah, they don't want to do really the goggles that or they, they, they want, they use the goggles, but the equipment's not that good. Right. Um, so to really experience it in a, in a more um, positive way, in a more satisfying way, in a more group orientation, people are starting to do it in an arcade format yeah. or in a walkthrough experience format. And, and they're using really uh, this virtual reality now for everything from gaming to sports to movies, right? Yes. Like it's in well, different industries. Well, dare I say uh, there's virtual reality porn as well. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. That's oh, a wow. big, look, this you is, know, this there's is money a to be made in show porn. I'm sorry, Wendy. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Have me as a guest and I, <laughs> chances are I'll, I'll take it towards PG, so. <laughs> well, uh, so, uh, I'm interested to know your background because uh, I know you're from Chicago Correct. and we want to figure out how you got here in the entertainment industry in LA. Um, 
I know your husband works at USC, yes? Yeah. As a professor He's in... He's actually chair of the marketing department at the Marshall School of Business. Oh, oh my so, gosh. Yeah. And is that what brought you to L.A. initially? Yes. Yeah. So um, I'm from Chicago. I was uh, practicing law for a while in Chicago, and then I ran the Chicago Theater, which is a landmark theater on State Street in Chicago. So you've always loved entertainment, but you were telling me that your dad had fled from Nazi Germany correct. and so he had this idea that entertainment was kind of fluff frivolous, and frivolous correct. there's the word and that you know he wanted you to have a real job and encouraged you to be a lawyer yeah right? I think there are probably a but lot of trying to marry the women two. out there a lot of women and people in general out there who yeah. came from similar backgrounds of people who wanted their children to be secure yes and so anything that was mildly creative yeah. outside the box was very right. frightening right they didn't want it to be actors, writers, artists, uh, artists anything yeah. like that. Um, I like to blame my dad for my um, entry as an entertainment attorney, but it, it's, it's also a byproduct of the fact that I just didn't have the talent. <laughs> because honestly, if I had talent of any renown, I would have said, Dad, it's okay, I'm still going to pursue entertainment. Yeah. But I think I knew inside, my talent was being an advocate, helping people um, think from a business perspective and, and that did, that was the con contribution to entertainment I could make. And you did share with me that because of his background that you always had this uh, you know feeling that you wanted to help the underdog. Well it's interesting because when when my dad passed away um, he was my last surviving parent so I was going through things and I found in eighth grade um, when I was growing up, they did a professional kind of analysis, what you what you should pursue based on various ways you answered questions. Yeah. I'd completely forgotten about it. Oh. And I ranked very high on um, law and politics. Really? Which shocked me, because I never really thought I wanted to be an attorney until yeah. I wound up going to law school. But in hindsight, what I really uh, thought is ever since I was conscious, ever since I can remember, advocating on behalf of people who weren't able to advocate as effectively for themselves was who I was. Yeah. I did it in every way and I do think it came from uh, growing up in <clears throat> excuse me growing up in a Holocaust um, environment. I'm yeah. from Skokie which was the largest enclave of Holocaust survivors settlement in the United States. I did not know that. You know you you informed me of that. I don't know that a lot of people know that. Uh, yeah, and it's called it was fam famous because in 1977 the <clears throat> uh, Illinois Nazi Party threatened to march through Skokie, and it was a big freedom of of speech. Um, and I have to admit, when you told me this story, uh, I never even knew there was a Nazi Party and that there was a march back then. And I mean, that is just like yeah, really. There was a movie actually scary. Made, made was of, a movie of, about it. It's called Skokie, oh um, and uh, yeah, it was it was a good movie. My the one little thing I have about the movie is the the mother, the Jewish mother, was just portrayed as so neurotic and helpless. Mm -hmm. It really bugged me. Yeah. But other than that, it was it was a, a good movie. Um, but yeah, we're a part. Oh, what of, was your mom like? My mom was a stay-at-home mom, okay. and um, I think my mom believed that that was her role. Right. Um, she always said she wished she could have gone to college. Her parents couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. And she took her role as a stay-at-home mom extremely seriously. And we had this conversation at our group lunch yesterday with the She Tank panel, people saying that most of them, and these are all really strong, successful women, most of them came from families where it was a stay-at-home mom. And it kind of was what perpetuated, the, perpetuated them to say, that's not what I want for myself. I want to go out and make a living and of course times were changing then and more uh, things were opening up for women but yeah. it kind of did uh, influence a lot of women to become independent on you know business owners entrepreneurs yeah and, I think that yeah. um, I saw a, a subterraneous kind of frustration in my mom um, of what she could have been right uh, she oftentimes did talk about that how much she wished she had yeah. the chance to go to college at that time that's what women did they they gave up their career and their that's life right. to be stay-at-home moms and raise their kids and nothing wrong with that but um, 
it is important, I think, to find what your gift is and give back to the world in that capacity too. Yes. Like, I mean, it's nice that today people realize they can do both. They can be a, a great mom and raise kids, and they can have a career. And yes, well, know. don't get me started of the inequities <laughs> between men and women in that department. Yeah, but, I know um, how you feel about that. Yeah, yeah. I I do have to say though, my dad was. Um, you know, for a for a traditional European, he was very progressive in his view of a woman's role. Um, I don't necessarily know where it came from, but ever since I can remember, my father always said, "Be independent." Do you think it came from? I know you told me they were very young when they fleed the country, mm -hmm. like twelve and eighteen, mm -hmm. something like that. Your, your my parent? dad was eighteen. Yeah, your, my mom was twelve. Good yeah. memory. Yeah. Wow. And. Uh, at that time, did they know they were going to get married? Probably They not. didn't know each they, other. They both oh, they didn't met know each in other. the German-Jewish oh. community in Chicago. Oh, gotcha. So he was 18, she was 12. They right. came they here. They came separately. Um, and, and, and they'd lost a lot of family Correct. in the Holocaust. So yeah. um, I can't imagine how that impacted them. But I can see, um, you know, you kind of said to me that, you know, they saw the good in people, they saw the evil in people, but they somehow had this came out of it feeling like there's this gray area about people. Yeah, my parents, honestly, uh, they were unbelievable people. To come from the circumstances that they came from and raise us with a sense of love for humanity, yeah. no bitterness. Um, that is amazing. It is amazing. And I think everybody has different experiences. You know, some people, they never got over that and it affected their life in a negative way. And then other people are more resilient and it yes. sounds like that was your I parents. I think that um, my dad in particular, he grew up, um, you know, the thing about Germany was the Jewish community was integrated. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a very assimilated community. My dad's community in particular was Jewish, non-Jewish. He grew up with oh. everyone. Diversity. Di total yeah. diversity. And I think he saw the pain that um, they felt for the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. um, he saw people really uh, risk their lives to help his family. Mm -hmm. um, my mother shared similar stories. There were also really horrible stories that they witnessed, and I think it was that duality, mm -hmm. that grayness, that they never forgot. And mm -hmm. um, I think that's why I'm so passionate about so many of the things that I do is um, I truly believe in the better of mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. in the better nature Me of too. people. Yeah. But I also am acutely aware of the uh, possibility for the not good part of the nature. Right. right. And that's raising its ugly head right now in our country. You know, I always do, same as you, believe that most people are good people. Um, but it is sad to see such an evil, dark side of people uh, coming, raising its head right now. That I didn't. I didn't really. I have to say, I was kind of naive. I didn't really know existed to the degree that it does. It's yeah. Well, you know, it, and, it, and it's a slow process. Yeah. Um, and also, um, it's good people that mm -hmm. that are making poor choices. In other words, um, yeah. they're not evil. They're not innately evil. It's mm -hmm. it's the it's their worldview. It's their perspective. And actually. Mm -hmm. Perception um, is a scary thing. It is a scary thing, mm -hmm. but it's a it's a it's a malleable thing. Yes, and that's where when it comes to women, the reason why I feel um, so excited to be a woman, and I'm, I'm as the older I get, the more I embrace our power. Uh, I don't know if you saw the movie Wonder Woman, but I loved it. You know, um, a woman's voice, I think, has an element, and I don't want to insult men. I think it's somewhat hormonally related to. But we have we bring something to the dialogue. Absolutely. I think that is is maternal. Um, there's a reason Native Americans called the Earth Mother Earth, mm -hmm. and I think that there is a hostility and a rage that's been burgeoning throughout the centuries. That it's time for women's um, way mm -hmm. and our nurturing and our empathy and our compassion and the way we process information to communicate we have got to have our voices heard. I always believe that uh, we need both voices at the table. Absolutely. And it's really uh, unbalanced right now. Very. Whether you're talking about the government where there's just a small percentage of women or any industry, whether right. it's attorneys or uh, Hollywood, uh, automotive, uh, science, you name it. Uh, this, the disparity is still there. But 
I do believe once we have it where it's more balanced when we're working toward that, and that's why women have to help women and men have to help women get into those positions right. of influence. When we have more women at the decision-making tables, the world will become a better place. I believe that, and yeah. I actually, again, to refer to what you're doing with your conference and with She Tank, it's fascinating. They've they've done, you know, peer-reviewed studies mm -hmm. of the systemic sexism in the entrepreneurial community, in the venture capital community. Yeah, well, we get less than 5% of the funding, uh, traditional funding. That means 95% goes to male businesses. Correct. So, you know, and less the, than 5%, uh, we definitely are disadvantaged, the, which is why She Tank is about women helping exactly. support women entrepreneurs. And yeah. it's, it's it can be as, as um, subversive as hand gestures or the nature of the product. Right. A man might just not understand why right. Spanx yeah. <laughs> would be an amazing product. Right. Um, and so, but we are the main consumers of, of families' income. Yeah. We make the purchase decision. That's the fascinating thing, isn't it? In most households, the majority of uh, purchasing decisions are made by the woman. Correct. But the ads and movies and everything are, are targeting men because it's men at the decision-making table Correct. as to what's being produced. It makes absolutely no so sense. To yeah. your point of having more diversity at the table mm -hmm. and having that be a good thing, I think that we all better from it because what we create will be more persuasive, mm -hmm. uh, how we communicate will be more persuasive, and um, I think it's time. And it'll affect everything from the environment to peace to finances, innovation, to, uh, homelessness, uh, education. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So um, we, um, our, our law firm, because we're women owned, mm -hmm. we have a soft spot. I don't want to chase any male clients away. Mm. Uh, we have a soft spot for women business owners and uh, entrepreneurs. And we are hoping that in addition to just our general practice, mm -hmm. that we can really help women who, um, you know, we, we hear sometimes that women are talked to differently by their professional uh, team. Right. Whether it's their attorneys, their, their accountants, there's a little s d dismissiveness sometimes uh, to their ideas mm -hmm. or um, just, just a implicit different way of speaking to them that bugs them. It just right. rubs them the wrong way. So when they come to your firm, they feel like they feel like they're heard and understood and spoken to with respect and the things that, you know, a smart entrepreneurial woman would like to align with. And that's, that's right. kind of what you guys are trying to do to change the playing field is give some women that are are smart, successful, that want to start a new endeavor, or have a great new invention that needs licensing or whatever, that uh, that you know Nolan Hyman uh, is a great place to to have uh, their legal work done because you guys are women and you understand uh, better how they think and and uh, you that's know that's right. And we try to be encouraging. My my dad always said he was an entrepreneur with with no high school education. And when I went to law school, he said, Wendy, just remember, if I listened to my attorney all the time, I'd never get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> and so we're very conscious at our firm of not being merely issue spotters, mm -hmm. but solution spotters. Oh, I love that. Spotters. Yeah. Um, the last thing we want to do is crush someone's yeah. dream. It does feel that way that the attorneys are always like, that, that can't be you done. Can't do you that. can't say you it can't that way. That. And, well, the fact yeah. of the matter is we have to protect you, yes, right? Yes. So it is our job to make sure that you do identify things right. that could be a problem. Right. However, that's not the end of the story, right? right? And, and not only do you uh, help them out legally and, and help cheer them on, but the solution part of it is, hey, have you thought about this as a way to monetize? Correct. I imagine is what you're saying. Correct. You, you help them beyond just the legal scope of here's your documents. That's right. I mean, we, I love that. we do try to be very strategic in our approach. Yeah. Um, and at one point when we were rebooting our website, we thought about having the header be, you know, exploit is not a bad word okay. because we typically think of exploitation as being so negative. But yeah. the fact of the matter is... Um, the more juice you can squeeze out of that apple, yeah. uh, the more of 
resources the creators have to work off of. Right. It's a good thing. Yeah. If you're an artist and you're being paid for what you do, that's a good that's thing. That's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. I like that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I, I'm very fortunate that I've been able to merge my, um, you know, my my avocation, my love for entertainment and the arts, mm -hmm. with my vocation, and then do it in a way that's really consistent with, you know, my values, my the the things I'm passionate about, which is really looking out for the little guy, yeah. uh, making sure that people get the support they need. Yeah. And then, you know, a subset of that is helping women, um, helping women do it because right. uh, um, we could have a whole show about my my concerns about the the inequalities that still exist between between the Really? Genders. You think there's some? No. <laughs> <laughs> you think? Thank you for what you're doing to help the inequality, and thank you for empowering women, and thank you for getting behind She Tank. Our um, pleasure. If people want to reach you, I know it's Nolan Hyman with two N's. Uh, yeah. dot com. Nolan Hyman with two N's. dot com. Yeah. Or they, you know, just Google Nolan Hyman. There aren't too many of many of us. Right. Um, yeah, and it's uh, it's our pleasure uh, to help. Whoever may need help, and if we're not able to help, we are just a phone call away from someone that yeah, can. Yeah, I know you guys are great at networking and putting people together. Yeah, we love that. Thank you for what you're doing, and thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much. We will be back next week with other great guests, and uh, just make it a great week. Hugs and happiness.